There were two women on my college crew who were training for the Olympics. And I mean, I was 17 years old and I looked at them and thought, I want to do that. If they can do it, I can do it. I'm like, what human being makes that kind of decision? <laughs> Each, each evening we, we tend to uh, um, have a fireside with two fellows and one mentor. And tonight is Ginny, I'm, who I, I'm really excited to dive into. This is your first program. You're now officially a part of the A Reasonable Family. And um, the more I've gotten to know you, uh, the more excited I've gotten about that. Because I think you have so much to add. And, and I want to unearth some of, some of your story. Uh, I want to start with now, which is you're one of the owners in the WNBA. Uh, can you tell us about why you're doing that? Well, um, the reason I did it and the reason I do it now, I think, are a little different. Yeah. But um, yeah. mostly because I've learned more about myself, I think, as I've uh, gotten into it. But uh, so 2008, for all NBA fans know that um, those lovely guys in Oklahoma uh, d <laughs> came in and bought the Seattle Supersonics and yeah. also bought the Storm. And... Um, I, so that was 2000, this was actually 2007 when I got involved, and I had started a family office, and, okay. um, really at my dad's request to help our family, and I had literally no background in the investment business other hmm. than that my father was an amazing investor, so, yeah. and I had, he, he was in New York, and I had left the East Coast and moved to Seattle, love him, but needed some distance from this very <laughs> successful man, so I had really no business being in the investment business, but I, yeah. you know, I'm a dutiful daughter, and um, really, he had done so much to make our lives great that I thought um, I wanted to continue and really do what he had asked, which is build a bridge to the future for my family. Yeah. So and I have three siblings. So by um, 2007, one of the things I had learned about the investment business was how male it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I was traveling a lot because one of the conditions was I was going to stay in Seattle and I'd travel back to New York a lot, which is obviously a pretty big mecca for the investment world. And I felt really disconnected from Seattle. So I was just kind of thinking to myself, I miss the community of women, and I miss being part of the Seattle community. Like, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I had started, I had actually grew up a big Yankees fan, became a Mariners fan. Um, and then really hated what was happening in Major League Baseball with steroids. Yeah. So I was looking mm -hmm. for a new sport, and that was when we found the WNBA. And the Storm, actually, in 2004, won uh, uh, their first WNBA championship, and that was when I stumbled on them. Yeah. So became kind of a fan, even though I'm really not a spectator fan. Yeah. Uh, I, it's hard for me to sit still that long. But uh, <laughs> games are shorter than basketball. Uh, baseball yeah. season is shorter. Um, and of course it's women, so yeah. it was, you know. So I ended up, uh, that summer of 2007 was when the state, the, the city, the county, the state was all trying to figure out, are we going to keep our team? Mm. Uh, basically we had to fund publicly the development of the arena. And actually I was proud of my community because they said no, even yeah. though, you know, we obviously ended up uh, losing the the Sonics. So I ended up buying in with these two other women who yeah. actually had a lot of experience. So that was kind of the motivation at the time. But what I realized, and what I now say is really what I said last night, yeah. is um, I had my own seminal experiences with uh, kind of what it was like to be the other, which mm -hmm. is hard for uh, you know a white girl who was, who was straight until she hit 40 yeah. and grew up on Park Avenue. But yeah. I managed it at Yale University <laughs> in the 70s um, by starting into, uh, a sport um, yeah. that was pretty male dominated. And I had a lot of experience with um, kind of just being unex kind of the, the odd person out. Yeah. And uh, it started a lifelong interest in generating access to opportunity for lack of a better phrase. And so the great thing about, uh, I mean, it's really actually not the great thing about the WNBA, yeah. but, it's an, um, but it, is the, it lives at the corner of business, sports, and social change. And yeah. one day it won't, hopefully. Yeah. But right now it does. And I, that's a really rich place uh, to, to work uh, yeah. and try to make an impact. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's really why I'm there. Love it. Love it. That's what's kept you there. Yeah. So, Judy, we shared dinner the other night, uh, but one thing that stood out to me was you, you seem to be remarkably self-aware. 
Um, I'm curious, what do you feel like is one thing that people get wrong about you? So my kids know this. Yeah. Um, is that I come across as a real hard ass, but I cry at the drop of a hat. They'll yeah. say, oh, look, there's a dying slug. Mom's going to cry. <laughs> so that really, I am a total mush. Yeah? yeah. But where, where do you think you come across as a hard ass? I haven't felt that. Where does that, where does that show up? Um, I think people, and it might be Seattle, are yeah. not... <laughs> Nobody um, honks in Seattle. Oh, yeah. I honk. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> that's because I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. Uh, I think because yeah. I'm willing to kind of call it as I see it, mm-hmm. I think part of it is I've gotten softer over the years and yeah. how to, figuring out how to say it without being aggressive in a way that somebody feels really criticized. And yeah. It took probably about 55 years to figure that out. But yeah. um, if I'm, a lot of people in Seattle are a little more indirect and are kind of willing to maybe go with the flow a little longer than I am if yeah. I see something <laughs> happening that I don't think is right. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a strength. Um, can backfire, though, yeah. right? Um, so uh, in terms of investment, right, you said you took over or you really started up the family office, so almost like a reluctant investor, deep reluctant CEO, reluctant investor. Um, and you said to bridge, right, the family kind of moving forward. Um, feels to me like... Uh, almost it's, it's about like legacy investing in some ways. I'm just curious, like what, what do you want your legacy to be with the investments of the family? You know, that's a really interesting thing. Uh, everybody acts like uh, having wealth is such a great thing. And yeah. one thing that having wealth does is it allows you not to think about uh, the basics that really contribute to survival that are necessary. Cool. Um, but it also brings a lot of negative yeah. um, side effects, especially if you're not thinking about them. And mm. What I've really tried to do is think about what were the, what's the value set that my parents gave me yeah. and my siblings. And uh, so I've, um, in fact, my daughter's an artist, and last year I asked her to create a replicable piece of something that everybody in the family could have. And she, came, she created coasters yeah. um, that have each one, there's, uh, I think, six different values and yeah. different photographs, one from my mom, one from, you know, from my dad. and So that's just an attempt to really ground my family in what's really most important about life, kind of whether you have money or not, yeah. this is actually the gift of the family. And you're lucky because wealth is really a function of luck in a lot of ways, especially when you're talking about inherited wealth. So like it or not, you actually do have more responsibility mm-hmm. than somebody else who mm-hmm. doesn't have this. And this is not your money to spend the way you want to. Yeah. There's And here's the value set yeah. for you to think about yeah. how you're going to use this. So that's how I think about it. What I usually yeah. say about myself is I'm much better at spending money yeah. than making money. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. lovely. All right, so out of those six values, I'm curious which ones that really stand out. Um, Probably bet on yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Have you have you relayed that to your kids? Um, well, I think, first of all, by talking about it, and also yeah. they uh, knew my parents. Yeah. Uh, and especially as they, they hit their 20s, um, really relating, uh, really, f- the other one was do what you love. My dad's mm-hmm. a big one. Of course, he didn't tell when he told me that when I was, you know, growing up. But then never really helped me figure out. Well, how do you do that? And actually, <laughs> like, you know. But um, I know that it's worked because my daughter told me that she was going to bet on herself, and she had a little trust money when she turned 25. She said, "I'm going to quit my job, and I really want to become an artist." And mm-hmm. she was actually a Division One um, recruited athlete in college, so she did not. She said, I didn't spend enough time really on my education, so now I'm going to invest in myself, and I'm going to become an artist. And I never thought she'd do it because I thought she needed much more structure. And she said, Papa said, bet on yourself. I'm like, well, how can I argue? You know, she's (laughs) applying it, and she's taking risks. And she said, and if the money runs out and I haven't made it, well, I know I have to figure it it out. So um, with each one of my kids, I see them expressing it in their own way. It seems like athletics has been an important part of your life Mm -hmm. journey. But were you a professional athlete? Am I making that up? Is that um, well, you know, I'm a little too old to be a professional athlete, but I'm a two-time Olympian. Wow. Right on! <laughs> okay, so what? <laughs> <laughs> what was your sport? What did you do? <laughs> um, 
Well, really, <laughs> I was channeling you because you had the height. Um, actually, I was a rower. Um, oh, right and I, uh, I started at Yale University in 1975, and Title IX was passed in 1972. Mm -hmm. um, and there were two women. Uh, the Canadians uh, in 1976 uh, had the Summer Games, and they added the sport of women's rowing. And kind of through the 80s was really when women's yeah. sports exploded on yeah. the Olympic scene. So this was a little early. Um, and there were two women on my college crew who were training for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things I love most about human beings is, I mean, I was 17 years old, and I looked at them and thought, I want to do that. If they can do it, I can do it. I'm like, what human being makes that kind of decision? <laughs> yeah. Like, we all do. It's like we see what's possible, yeah. and then we just, like, m make it our own. Yeah. And I just, uh, I loved the experience of rowing in college. I mm. had um, been to all-girls schools through 11th grade and had... Uh, really never been in an educational environment with guys. And, yeah, it was two-thirds men at that point. Yeah. So the women's crew was a very grounding influence for me. Mm. Um, and I just loved working that hard and pushing myself and learning about how far I could go. And so that was kind of the start of it. But it was kind of brutal. Yeah. <laughs> when you were saying, you know, if I'd known what it was going to take, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so, yeah, I uh, tried out three years in a row, got cut every time, yeah. like, was ready to give up when a friend of mine had made the team in 79 and said, no, the coach was really excited about you. Don't give up yet. So I was like, okay, one more year. And yeah. I had graduated from college, and my father said, um, I paid for your education, but let's go, girlfriend. Mm. You know, you got to get going. So I got a job and trained and made the 80 team. Nice. But we boycotted. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, so. I have so many more questions. Um, <laughs> this, this will be my last one. Uh, hopefully we can get into that in the Q&A. But I've also seen a theme. There's been this theme of athletics and like self-determination, family and values, but also gender dynamics, right? With all-girls school, going to Yale, picking a sport that formerly women weren't um, right. really active in, the WNBA investor, right, uh, in this landscape of uh, male-dominated. I mean, how how have you shown up? Because that's that's not uncommon and in this room as well, right? We just look at the demographics of the CEOs. There's fewer <laughs> women than men. Um, what's your perspective to women um, who are in these male-dominated environments? You know, I just think you have to really want what you want, mm. um, and you're going to put up with more bullshit. There's kind of no question about it, but it just goes with the territory, and it's just not what you focus on. Because, yeah. I mean, really what is so, <coughs> the thing that's most inspiring to, for me to be here, uh, about being here, is that each entrepreneur has a dream that mm -hmm. is so powerful, you're willing to go through whatever it takes, despite if you'd known what it was going to take, right? <laughs> um, and yeah. that's what you need I mean, I have a certain set of things yeah. I had to go through as a woman, and then, as it turned out, a gay woman. But yeah. um, I think everybody has their own package of what they have to go through. So I'm not that unique yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Um, it still sucks. Yeah. But, and believe me, yeah. I'm in WNBA board meetings with NBA owners who are billionaires who forget that women actually belong in the room. And I'm 61 years old, yeah. and I still can't believe it's happening. Yeah. So it's not like it's over. Yeah. Well, Jeannie, you're proving them wrong. And if we can do anything to support in your efforts, we're going to do it. We're so grateful to have you here as a mentor. Thank, Thank you. you.